My name is John Taka. I'm presenting you today an argument against global warming, which I refer to as peeling the rotten onion. The first thing you need to do when discussing global warming is state a definition. Because often people will attempt to change the meaning of the word, even in the middle of a sentence. Here's my definition. Which, by the way, I believe is the most common intended meaning when used by global warming activists. Global warming is a global increase in temperature caused by man-made CO2, which will result in eminent and catastrophic changes to our planet unless resolved by government-mandated reductions in commercial and consumer CO2. So, like a rotten onion, you have to peel back the layers of this definition to see the rotten core. So let me start with the first layer of the onion, which talks about global increase in temperature. Global increase in temperature. What does that mean? The concept is complicated because it requires measuring or estimating temperatures for every point on the globe spread out through all the seasonal and yearly variations and then looking at these values over centuries. So let me zoom on by this illustration and merely make the point that it's a lot of data. Data that is not perfect because there are lots of gaps and guesses. Now if you take this data and apply averaging techniques to it, you come up with what is the average temperature that has increased over the past hundred years is about 0.7 degrees Celsius. This is what the United Nations International Panel on Climate Control did in their last fourth assessment report published in 2007. This is the data that is most often quoted as the scientific consensus for global warming. This is also the same data that had all the controversy regarding climate gates and the like. So this chart you can find in millions of elementary and high school textbooks from the GISS agency, which is essentially NASA. You might think that this is talking about completely different numbers, but it's not. This chart compares the difference in the average temperature from a defined norm temperature. If you look close, though, it says the same thing. The average temperature over the past 100 years or so has increased less than 1 degree. I show this slide to remind people that less than 1 degree difference in average temperature over 100 years it's not something that a human is going to feel and certainly not going to recognize the very slight changes that occur over several years. Now there are many stories about global warming causing all sorts of changes in the natural world, from petunias to polar bears. But these changes are un very unlikely to have anything to do with reported average global temperature change of less than one degree over the past hundred years. You and the rest of the natural environment are far more reactive to things like changes in precipitation, changes in the distribution of temperatures, something like hot summer and a cold winter, and most certainly changes in the local climate. So here's a different graph with completely different scales. This data comes from the Vostok ice cores in Antarctica. We're no longer talking about tenths of a degree. We're talking about degrees. And we're looking at the perspective throughout the time span of humankind. The difference in temperature here is relative to now. So zero is at the present day. At this scale, we can't even tell the controversial rapid increase of the last hundred years. 
we note that it's been warmer and it has been cooler and that rapid increases are not unusual. So what should we make of this? As for me, I accept this conclusion of the global warming activist, that the Earth is getting warmer by about one degree over the past hundred years. I accept this not because it's a scientific fact, not because the UN makes this statement, not because someone declares this to be a scientific consensus. No, I accept this because looking at the historical temperatures, it's reasonable. Earth's temperatures fluctuates a bit. And for periods of time, it's either increasing or decreasing. And considering that we just got finished with the Little Ice Age around the end of the 18th century, it's reasonable to assume that the temperature is increasing. So for me, this layer of the onion doesn't smell that bad. Which brings us to the next layer of the onion, where it starts to stink. And this is the claim of a casual relationship between man-made CO2 and this complete global temperature increase of roughly one degree. So I'd like to start off with a simple experiment. Now this experiment is something that almost anyone can do. There are of course more sophisticated versions of this experiment, most of which will try to minimize the conductive heat loss. But this simplistic version will suffice to make my point. We take a bottle filled halfway with water. We place it in a location with a steady temperature. You add a heat lamp above it and let the air in the bottle come to a rest at some steady temperature. Roughly around room temperature is good. So next we add Alka-Seltzer tablets to the bottle of water and we cap it so that the air in the mixture becomes mostly CO2. Now wait for the temperature to reach an equilibrium temperature from the heat lamp and measure the change in temperature of the air in the bottle. If the experiment was done right, any increase in temperature should be completely caused by only one factor and one factor alone, the increase in CO2. So the concentration of CO2 in the bottle of air is very high, probably greater than 90%. Earth's atmosphere has a concentration of CO2 of 0.038%, of which the man-made contribution is only a very small fraction of that. So if such a small percentage of CO2 causes the equilibrium temperature of the Earth to increase by one degree, one should expect the temperature of the bottle with 90% CO2 concentration to result to an increase of temperature far greater than that. So what's the result? I encourage you to try this. Because if you were able to measure any increase, it will be far, far less than a degree. So this experiment should help you question the statement about CO2 alone being the cause of our temperature increase. Now I'm not claiming that this bottle is a good model for Earth. It is, after all, extremely simplified. Earth is much more complex. But this is just the kind of simplification that we're asked to believe from global warming activists when they claim that man-made CO2 has caused 
a runaway global increase in temperature. The Earth has been around for a very long time. It appears to be, if anything, a self-regulating system where all sorts of fluctuations in temperature influences are kept at a balance. To claim that man-made CO2 is the sole cause of the past 100-year temperature increase is to completely ignore historical variations and irresponsibly simplify a very complex system. Yet the third layer of the onion is even more irresponsible. This layer refers to the predictability of eminent catastrophic climate change. Here, global warming is claimed to be the cause of all sorts of poorly understood, complicated phenomena like drought, hurricanes, floods, sea rise, and in general extreme weather. All of this is given one simple, neat explanation that is because of man-made CO2. Furthermore, these explanations come with dire prophecies of much more disasters to follow. These doomsdayers try to keep their predictions vague. The main line of logic is that the doomsday possibility is not worth the risk, so you better do whatever they tell you to do for safety's sake. The truth is, is that science is not very good at handling these kind of prophecies. When the predictions are of a complex phenomenon with lots of variables and where the predictions are not readily reproducible, it is nearly impossible to come up with reliable numbers on the probability of these prophetic events. However, when the stakes are high, it's reasonable to try to come up with some way of determining is the risk worthy of taking note of. Distributed human knowledge, like that in economics, is one way. We know that most of the catastrophes of global warming revolve around the increase in sea levels as a result of polar cap melting. If the sea level rise occurs, many of the coastal cities of the world will be destroyed. Now everyone has access to this kind of prophetic predictions. But as one can quickly observe, the property values and the building investments for these coastal areas seem completely unaffected by these disastrous predictions. Hundred-year investments on building projects are routinely made by all sorts of business ventures in these coastal cities. So why do these investments in coastal cities continue? Why have people not moved away to higher ground? Why is the distributed knowledge of millions of different people and investment organizations not concerned with even the possibility of these prophetic predictions? So I would argue that this is because the market, this distributed knowledge, has concluded the possibility of these events is so remote that it's not even worth considering. In the same way that we do not walk around with a lightning rod given the slight possibility that we might get struck by lightning. Which brings us to the last layer of the onion, the rotted core. The government solution to reduce CO2 output through bureaucracies that use either carbon credit schemes or regulatory schemes to decide how much CO2 each company is allowed to produce. The environment that this creates is one of corruptibility. Big government closely interwined with private businesses to the point where you can't even tell them apart. Companies with the right connections are winners and everyone else, including the general public, are losers. The ironic thing about this supposed solution 
is that it, it doesn't even attempt to reduce the CO2 in the atmosphere. All it does is control who will be allowed to put it there. Technical solutions to remove CO2 from the atmosphere are completely ignored in favor of these least effective and most financially damaging political solutions. Not only does it not reduce CO2 from the atmosphere, if looked at from the long-term global economic perspective, it doesn't even reduce what would be added because it claims that carbon energy supplies of the world would just be abandoned by the rest of the world. As the population increases and the impoverished people of the world attempt to improve their quality of living, it's guaranteed that carbon-based energy solutions will be used. But then again, this was never about solving a real problem. It was about disguising the rottenness of this onion called global warming.